everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. I'm very happy to welcome back Blake Rudis for how to prepare for battle with a photograph. Hey, Blake. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Blake is a Photoshop enthusiast with a strong fine art background. From painting in front of the TV with Bob Ross as a child to printmaking and sculpture, he has always had a passion for anything creative. He currently has a thing for HDR photography, and you can see more of his images and Photoshop tutorials at everydayhdr.com. With that, let me go ahead and turn over the screen to Blake. All right. All right, we see my ugly mug on there? <laughs> we do. <laughs> okay, awesome. So uh, first, as always, before I start this, I want to say thank you to the ladies and gentlemen, Topaz, Nicole, Darcy, and everyone there who creates these awesome plugins and learning environments for us. It's just absolutely incre incredible that you have such a great company that, that offers that to us. So what I'm going to be talking about today is preparing for battle with a photograph. And where this comes from uh, is, is from a lot of questions I get from individuals asking me about, you know, where do I start? What do I do? Uh, there's so many plugins. Which one do I use? When do I use it? How do I know if I'm using it right? And you know, you get this like convoluted uh, type thing going on in your head, and then self-doubt kicks in, and then boom, you're done. So what I'm equating this to is military strategy. I've spent uh, the last almost 14 years in the military, so I figured why not incorporate uh, some of my military training in with photography. Do uh, I'm a Gemini, so I have a dichotomy. I'm an artist in the military. Uh, it's one of those great things. So preparing for battle, it's it's all about strategy. You know, nobody goes into a, a battle without a plan. If you do, you're going to fail. So the same thing happens with the photograph. And there are many different battle strategies you can have with your photograph. I'm, I'm going to keep using that, but that's really just kind of a, a cute way to refer to your workflow as a battle, as how you bring it to the table. It actually makes it seem a little bit more uh, impressive when you say, yeah, I, I had this rough battle today with this photograph. Man, it just, you know, it was tough, but I won. <laughs> so there are many different approaches you can take on this. And what I've done is I've created a 25-page uh, workbook to kind of go along with this. It's going to go over all the different strategies that I'm going to be using today as, as well as all the settings. So if you're, if you're trying to scramble around and take notes, uh, don't worry about it too much. The notes are available for you. However, I understand that taking notes and following along is definitely better for your learning experience. So afterwards, uh, you can go to everydayhdr.com and get the, uh, there's a link that's going to be sent out and uh, that'll be taken care of through uh, Nicole. So the first approach I want to talk about is the indirect approach. And the indirect approach when you are talking about um, a war strategy is, is first you upset the enemy's equilibrium. So you're, you're focusing on the weakness and attacking the strengths. And you can do the exact same thing in your photographs. So what you're looking at here, this is in a three exposure image that has been merged into Photomatix Pro. And when I merge my images in Photomatix Pro, all I'm trying to do is create a low contrast image. So you can see in this low contrast image, there is no black, there is no white, there's a lot of weakness, but there are some strengths that we can exploit. So this is the first approach, the indirect approach, the what I do with my tone mapped images right after I get out of Photomatix and jump into uh, Photoshop. Now, uh, last time there was a question, so I'm going to go to actually before I start talking, I'll let Clarity load Topaz Labs and go to Clarity. Clarity is going to be our indirect approach. After the last webinar, there was a comment on the webinar about you know how I use Clarity, and the the question was, can can't you just use Adobe Camera Raw? And the question is yes, the answer is yes, you can use Adobe Camera Raw for this. However, it's not nearly as intuitive when it comes to your different uh, contrast settings here. So there's definitely more here. But also on the same note, some people don't have Lightroom, they don't have Camera Raw. A lot of people that I just talked to have only maybe Topaz Clarity and the Topaz software along with PaintShop Pro. So this would be one of those definite reasons as to why to use Clarity. However, I'm also using Clarity for this because I feel that Clarity, uh, next to my digital and color zone systems, is the closest thing I can get to creating a very good photograph and very quickly. So with this indirect approach, we want to fix the weaknesses and target the strengths. The strengths are we've got we've got the ability here to bring out some white and some black, but the, it's it's like a low contrast. It's kind of muddy, but you actually see photos like this online. So how do you know what to fix? Well, if we go down here to the HSL filter and go to saturation and drop the saturation all the way down, we are now looking at a black and white image. But what you'll see here is that there is no black 
and there is no white. Those are the stars of the show for a black and white image. And it's called contrast, and with that contrast, you, when you make a good black and white photograph, you're also making a good color photograph. So what else helps us? Well, last time we discussed the histogram in great detail during that webinar, and I'm taking it easy on you this time. I'm actually focusing more on the artistic side of my processing rather than the technical side for uh, uh, because it's sometimes it's more fun to just drop the technical stuff. But I can't guarantee that you're not going to learn anything technical either. So here in the histogram, the histogram is going to tell us that there's not a whole lot of black here. There's not a whole lot of white here. So what do we do to fix that? Well, in the micro contrast settings, we can bring out some of the the lighter areas and darker areas in those micro contrast areas, which also is going to bring about some noise if we move it too far up. So with this, I'm just going to go down to about uh, the negative, about 17 mark. With the, with the micro contrast, I tend to like to push those to the left a little bit because as you push them to the left, it kind of makes things smoothed out. It's almost like noise reduction in the micro contrast areas. So if I go down to like negative 17 or negative 20, it's going to give me a pretty decent smoothed out kind of uh, texture over those areas that if I bring it up is going to be really noisy. So I'll bring that down to about that negative 20 range. And the low contrast, as this is like stair steps of contrast. The micro contrast is really small. The low contrast gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we move up with these higher areas of contrast. But you can see even with those quick adjustments, it already made this image better. So with the low contrast, we'll go up a little bit to about the, uh, let's just keep going. What I like to do is really move all the way to the right, all the way to the left, see what it's going to give me, and then just kind of stop somewhere that my eye is comfortable with. And that, that looks about good. I know that's not a very technical way to make adjustments, but it really does help. So with the medium contrast, do the same thing. Bring it all the way up, bring it all the way down, and then just find somewhere nice that matches right in between. I think that's pretty good right there. Same with the high contrast. Now with the high contrast, we're going to be getting to these big areas of blacks and whites. And look what's happening to our histogram as we do this. If I move this all the way to the right, we have a, a lot of high contrast adjustments. So there's going to be a lot of whites and a lot of blacks in here. You can already see that the black areas are getting really dark. But I don't need to fix that right now. I'm just going to do that later down here in the tone and level areas. So if we move the contrast up, we can now look at our black and white levels here. And if we need to, we can maybe move those black levels up. If we move the black levels up, they're going to get lighter. If we move them to the left, it's going to get darker. And why it's doing that is as we move the black levels to the left, it's going to be forcing the histogram to the left to push all that data towards the black side. If we move it to the right, it's going to be forcing all that data to the right side. So let's just move that up just a slight bit. And then we'll look at our midtones. And same thing there. It's going to force our histogram left and right. I don't think I'm going to do anything with the midtones because I don't like what either of those adjustments did. And maybe a little bit with the whites. Yeah, definitely, because it brings out some of the chrome here in, in, our, uh, in our airplane here. So let me now go down here to the HSL adjustments. Take the saturation all the way out again. And now let's take turn off the dynamics and turn off the tone and see the difference in our image now. Let's turn those back on so you can see just how much we've done to this photograph already. Look at how much better this image looks with our black and white image. So now we can just bring that all the way back. And then if we look at our hue, saturation, and luminance levels, I know that with this, I'm, I'm all right with the yellows, I'm all right with the reds, just by looking at the image. But the blues, I have some issues with the blues. So let me go ahead and bring the saturation up in the blues a little bit. And I can bring up the luminance, make that a little bit lighter or a little bit darker to bring out some of that area. And I'll just bring it up just a little bit to make that a little bit lighter. Now, one thing I don't like that came along with that was it took my blue that's right here on the side of the, the jet and it, it, it made it kind of amplified a little bit. So let's go into the masks and we can actually hide that. So we can just paint right here and that will hide any of that just in what we did with the hue, saturation, and lightness. So we'll go ahead and press OK, open this up in Photoshop and see where we are. And typically, this would be stage one of my workflow. I have a, well, actually stage two. I have a four-step creative process. The first step is the cameras and tone mapping. So I already did that before we came into the webinar. That second step would then be your uh, pre-processing. To me, this would be the pre-processing. There's still some stuff that needs to be done to this, but this is a very good start. So we got ourselves off to a nice start. So now the, the rest of the stuff I'm going to show you is more into my fourth step, which is going to be my creative post process. So we, we went ahead and showed the indirect approach and how we can make a poorly tone mapped image better. Actually, I wouldn't say poorly tone mapped. It's actually pretty well tone mapped if you're tone mapping specifically for a low contrast image. I wouldn't post this on anything. I wouldn't show it. I wouldn't print it because it's, it's kind of it's devoid of those blacks and whites. 
So let's take a look at three more uh, strategic approaches that you can use. So this image was actually taken in uh, Africa during a, um, a training mission. It's pretty cool. Just kind of, I got to go out candidly and just kind of photograph the guys as they were doing their thing. And th this is a pararescue man in the Air Force, and he's a pretty good friend of mine. So what I want to do with this is show three more approaches. And the first one is going to be the Blitzkrieg approach. So I'm going to press Control J to duplicate the background layer. And, and the Blitzkrieg approach is it's it's a concentrated force. It's a it's a rapid speed. Uh, to break through your photographs, uh, enemy lines, your enemy lines, your photographs lines. So really, what this is going to be do, it's going to be a harsh, a nasty adjustment, and I'm going to do it on purpose because I want to show you that even with a uh, a bad strategy, you can still recover. So let's go to filter, let's go to Topaz Labs, and let's go to adjust. So I'm going to go ahead and reset this, and go to my global adjustments, go to adaptive, my adaptive exposure here. I'm really going to ramp this up pretty high. And if you have never used Topaz Adjust before, if you're just seeing this for the first time, basically your adaptive exposure here is going to be the slider that you use to uh, create your exposure adjustment. And then the regions are how many different areas in the photo it's broken down into to make those adjustments. It's a pretty intuitive uh, way to target certain areas in your photograph. So if I bring this all the way up, I'll bring this actually to about the 50. Yeah, let's bring it all the way up. A lot, lot of regions and a lot of stuff going on. So you can see already that this is like a, a really bad HDR photograph. But there's a lot of good stuff happening too in the mid-tone areas. And that's really what I'm going to concentrate on. And I'm not worried about anything right now. You're going to see that I'm going to make this a really nasty, ugly photograph. Because this is the Blitzkrieg. This is just go in and pummel this photograph. And actually, let's do something really daring. Let's bring the strength all the way up and then even bring the detail boost up. Oh, yeah, really nasty really gnarly, and if you've ever uh, bought Topaz Adjust, I guarantee every single one of you in this webinar who's ever used Topaz Adjust has done something like this when they first bought it and said, this is wicked cool, because that's what I did when I first bought it. So we'll just ramp those up. This is our Blitzkrieg. This is the run in and, and just make a really gnarly looking photo. But if you double click right here in Photoshop, now this is very Photoshop specific. If you're using something else other than Photoshop, you probably won't be able to do this. So we're going to go ahead and double click right here, and you're going to see that there's these things called blend if options. Let me go ahead before I do that and just make this the uh, make this a little bit larger so you can see this one over all the other ones. Okay, so now I'm going to double click right here, right next to where it says layer one. You just double click in there and you're going to see blending options. Now what you're seeing right here is let's just go right down here to the blend if. Blend if is a really scary thing, but when you look at it, if you just say right here, protect the underlying layers, blacks or whites, that's all you have to think about, because watch this. The underlying layer has black in it, and that's going to be spe specifically right here in uh, some of the gear that he's got on his body. So if I move this over, you're going to see how it starts bringing back what's underneath. It's protecting those black areas from underneath. But it does it in a really pixelated, kind of nasty way. So if you press Alt or Option, you can actually split that slider and feather it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say basically protect anything that's black up to here, and then feather everything up to 128, which is basically going to be my midtones, or 122. That's good. So now let's move back here into our nasty looking sky that we have here. If you ever get haloing, uh, Nicole and I were just talking about this before the webinar, that sometimes you get some haloing when it comes to Topaz adjust, and that's just the way the algorithm runs, and it's it's nothing uh, negative. There's ways to fix it, and typically, most of the things you have to do to fix it are, are difficult, but not right now. So what I'm going to do here is say anything in the underlying layer that's white, protect those areas, and boom, look at that. All that sky starts to get protected. Alt Option and move that over and protect anything in the background up to 128. Press OK. So now we had that nasty Blitzkrieg approach that actually gave us some really cool detail in our midtones, but it made everything else nasty. Well, look what you can do there. Just use the tools that you have to make that better. So now I'm going to actually make a mask on here, just because this is kind of bothering me. And I'm going to paint in, in right back here in black around this area so that uh, I don't have anything back there. I press the, the key right next to the right bracket key, the forward slash key. That gives you what's called a quick mask, and you can just kind of really kind of go in there and mask out these areas. And I'm just going to do something kind of quick just for the sake of argument here. So if we turn that on and off, you can see all of our mid-tone details. Got all of the benefits from that, but our blacks and our, our whites didn't.
So then we have another approach, another strategy that you can use, and that's going to be deception. And the whole deception wartime strategy is to uh, to deceive, trick, or fool the enemy, or in this case, photograph, to leverage the advantage. Now, how do we do that? Well, we're going to use Topaz Glow because Topaz Glow can actually be a very sneaky, deceptive program if you use it correctly. So let's go into Topaz Glow. Okay, let's just go ahead and we can actually select almost anything in here, but what I'm going to do is go through in the graphics section here. I'm going to go down to this one right here, the sketch outline. And a lot of what Glow does is it just creates, uh, and some of these can be really graphic like the ones that you see here in the graphics section, but it, it, it kind of makes these uh, electrical lines all over your photograph. Now, for, for this photograph's sake, I'd probably never process it like this. But if I select soft light, what it does is everything that is 50% gray will remain untouched. Anything white will get amplified by that soft light adjustment. Anything black will also, but it will never get pure black and never get pure white. So if we look at the original, what it's doing is it's just giving us a nice glow to this image, almost as if we shot this photograph um, with a uh, kind of a high key concept in mind. So it's deceptive in nature that this photograph could have been taken like this, but we use something like Topaz Glow to make it a little bit better. So now let's look at another method. This other method is going to be the shock and all method. And the shock and all method or the shock and all strategy is to use overwhelming power to achieve rapid dominance over a photograph. And there is no program that does that better than something like Topaz Impression because it just rapidly goes in there, makes a really awesome looking photograph, whether it's painted or not. Another thing about Topaz Impression is that, you know, Topaz Impression, when used for face value, can sometimes look like you just used a filter to, to do it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you the shock and all approach to get this. Uh, we'll just use the charcoal effect. I actually really do like the charcoal effect and even the Da Vinci sketch one. I like that one too. But for this one, we'll use the charcoal effect. And if you see what's going on here with the charcoal effect is that there's some white kind of showing up. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the adjustments here and then just make the brush size just slightly larger so that it actually just, there's no white on the face because that was kind of distracting on that facial area. So now I'm going to press OK on this, and you're going to see that I now have three totally different approaches to the exact same image. All three of them on their own could be very well done photographs. I could, I could post something like this, I could post something like this or like this. But what happens, just like in wartime, if you mix those strategies. So let's go ahead and move this layer. I'm just going to press the V key and then press and hold shift and move this onto this one. So now I can do the same thing here. I can do the same thing with the blending options here that I did with the Topaz Adjust layer. I can double click in here and I can blend if. Protect anything underneath. If let's say it's white, we'll protect those areas underneath if it's white. And now we can see some of that blue coming back in that area behind there. So we're kind of mixing our strategies here. Okay, and then I can move this over a little bit, protect any of the blacks, and then I can even go into the blending options and make this something like soft light to really kind of darken up those areas, but not have it uh, not have it really uh, affect it, it too bad. It just kind of darkens up some of the sides here, that soft light adjustment. And then I can take the impression one, move this on over, press and hold shift, and now I can change this to something like luminosity. So now, because I change this to luminosity, it's not affecting the color in the image. It's only affecting the tone. So when I apply it on there, it's just it's just giving me all of the uh, underlying colors underneath there on this impression layer. So here is, let's go right back to the beginning here and look at the history. Just scroll on up and we'll look at the history. There's the original and here's the after. After all those effects that we put onto the, actually, let me go down one more. There's the after. Before after. So when you combine those strategies, and this would be that fourth step I'm talking about, the fourth step in my workflow, which is the creative post-processing step. All of these steps are outlined in that download too. So before we even go into all of these different strategies, it shows you what my four-step creative process is. 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the full on frontal assault. And this is where we're going to take just about everything we've got and we're going to throw it at this one. Uh, this photograph was actually taken during uh, another training mission in a survival uh, type training mission. This is where we go out in the woods and we walk around and uh, you have to call in helicopters and do all kinds of fun stuff. It, it really is pretty cool. So. Now, this could be another a plug for the Air National Guard, all of you young guys out there who are interested in maybe staying at home but uh, want to take part in some of this military stuff. The Air National Guard could be your calling. So that's a little commercial for you. So what's this full frontal assault? Well, the full frontal assault what we're going to do is we're going to give this everything we've got. We're going to attack this image from all different sides. We're even going to skip all the pre-processing. We're just going to go right to the creative process because sometimes people don't have a creative workflow like I do. Sometimes you don't have a four-step process. Some people just open up an image, they come right into it, and they just start going to town on it. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I like to have a set workflow in mind when I work. So this is going to be, let's just jump in here. We're going to use Topaz Adjust. We're going to use Impression. We're going to use Glow. We're going to use black and white effects. And we're going to use Topaz Restyle and even some stuff right here in Photoshop. So we'll, when we get done with this, we're going to have a really artistic, almost graphic novel looking photograph. So the first thing we need to do if we're going to be doing this correctly, is duplicate the background image. I usually always duplicate the background image when I'm working, especially in this nature, when I know for a fact I'm going to be building up a lot of layers. And duplicate that background layer by pressing Command or Control J, and then I'm going to go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and Adjust. Now for this one, I don't want to do the full-on nasty uh, Blitzkrieg approach, so let's go into our adaptive exposure, and let's go ahead and bring that up a little bit, and then bring the regions up a little bit. Bring the regions all the way up. Okay, so that I usually, when I come into Topaz Adjust, I like to bring the regions all the way up. And the reason why is that it gives me the most selection of the area. Now, if I go all the way to the right on this one, we're going to get a really nasty, uh, too far image. We need to blend these strategies in a way that it's not going to overwhelm the image in the end. So I'm going to bring that up to about 0.55 ish in that area. And then bring the regions all the way up. Because if I leave the regions down, uh, we get quite a bit of contrast in here that builds up a little too quickly. So again, I'm kind of trying to make that low contrast image so I can use other things to build off of that later. So I still kind of come back to that same mindset in my workflow where I'm trying to make a low contrast, almost tone mapped image here with one single, what was a raw file, right here in uh, Topaz Adjust. So let me go to the details here. Uh, I've got a nice little, looks like a pretty good contrast here. Um, I don't want to do any protection to the highlights or any protection to the shadows. We'll just go ahead and drop those down. And brightness, I'm just going to leave that the same. Let's go to details, open up those details. And let's take a look at the strength of those details. We'll bring the strength up quite a bit on this one because I really, what I really want to do here is bring out a lot of the detail in the helicopter. Now, I'm not worried about the background right now. So I'll show you kind of how I do this. A lot of times when I'm working in my workflow, I separate the foreground and background elements. I do that in a number of ways. Sometimes I use something like Topaz Remask. Other times I just use regular masking. So for this, what I'm really trying to do is just bring out all the details in this helicopter. I'm not worried about the background. I will focus on the background later in some of these other programs. So let's go and bring up the detail boost a little bit to really bring up some of that. Let's go to about 1.09-ish. So already we have quite the, uh, the distinct image here. It's, it's gone a little too far, but that's okay because we're going to put some protective measures in, in, in place here. And let me go and zoom in here real quick and see what our noise looks like. So our noise looks pretty bad. So I'm going to go right into the noise section here and just do some slight noise suppression. And just go up just to about 1, 1.0. And then I'll drop my amount down a little bit. So I, I suppress some of that noise there. If we look at the before and after on the noise, that definitely is going to help me out later as I do some more of these adjustments. So I'll go ahead and just press OK. And that's going to bring me right back into Photoshop. And from here, this is where I want to um, mask out just my helicopter. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to make a mask, and I'm going to do that same trick that I showed you earlier. I'm going to press the uh, forward slash key, which is going to give me, uh, you're not going to see it now until I start painting, but that's going to give me a, uh, 
a red kind of haze over this, which is called a quick mask. And actually what I'm doing is it's a reverse mask. If I take that haze off, basically what I'm doing is I'm painting away the effect because I know that at any time I can press Command or Control I on my mask and that will invert it for me. And that will invert that mask. So as I start painting on here, at this point I'd be painting in white to bring some of that stuff back. I'm just going to control I here real quick. It's not really doing what I want it to do. Okay. Okay. Let me just paint in black first, and then I'll teach you that trick. Okay, so I'll paint in black first. I'm painting in black on the area that I want to eventually uh, save. Okay. And then I'll show you the inversion trick in a second. All right, this is that awkward pause in, in everyone's tutorial where uh, you just watch somebody paint. It's kind of like you're watching Bob Ross in the digital world. <laughs> I, I, that's one of those things that when I'm, when I'm doing this, when I actually watch some other people that are masking, I'm like, oh, this is taking forever. And then they don't, they don't try to fix that awkward silence with uh, pointless dialogue like I am. Okay. So I'll just keep painting this here, and I usually start with a big brush and then work my way in with a finer brush along those edges. Now I'm using a Wacom tablet, and the beauty of a Wacom tablet is that the Wacom tablet is pressure sensitive. So if I move over here, you can see I'm, I'm drawing over here, but it's not doing anything. But at the harder I press, the more it comes out, and the less I press, the uh, less appears, which is great for masking because as you get closer to those f those finer edges and stuff, you can just slowly let off the brush as you get to these edges, and your brush actually your brush size actually changes to a smaller brush size. So you know it, a Wacom tablet. You know a lot of people are like, let me go buy more lenses, or let me get a new camera, or let me get this. It's going to make me a better photographer. Actually, you know a two hundred dollar purchase on a Wacom tablet. It's going to make you a better uh, photo editor. So before you think about buying that new lens or, or maybe that new mirrorless camera, you should probably consider a Wacom tablet before that. So there's a nice plug for Wacom. And it doesn't have to be Wacom, any tablet, really, in general, because most of it, as long as it has pressure sensitivity, it's going to be good. Okay, so now I'll take that, right, that, that forward slash key off. And the reason why you want to spend that much time on making this mask is when I press Command or Control I, that's going to invert that mask. And if you see here, that's making, let me go to my panel options and make this a little bit bigger. If you go into the panel options, you can actually change the size of how big your layers appear in your layers palette. So now you can see that that mask is slightly larger. And the reason why you want to make a good mask first is that all of the adjustments that I'm going to make from here on out, I can just copy that mask from one image to the next and they just piggyback off of each other. So if you make one really good mask and, and separate that foreground element or your focal point from the background, it's going to help you in the end. So just right there, that made us a better photograph. But let's take this a little bit further. One of the things that I do with my photographs, and you, you, you won't even notice it, but I use Topaz Impression for that shock and awe factor. But one of the things that I use with Topaz Impression is a very, um, you wouldn't even know that I was using Topaz Impression type route. So that's, I'm going to show you that now. I'll press Control, Shift, Alt, and E. That's going to create a layer stamp. Control, Shift, Alt, and E. Command, Shift, Option, and E on a Mac. It's going to make a layer stamp. So let's go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and Impression. Basically what this is doing is that everything I do up here is not going to affect anything I have below it. But now what I'm doing is I'm using Topaz Impression to process for the background. So no matter what happens to my foreground, I'm not worried about it. I just want it, I just want it to affect my background. This looks awesome with that charcoal preset too. It looks just like I would have drawn it. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go to painting. And one of my favorite ones, is, I'm kind of partial to it. I like the Georgia O'Keeffe ones. Um, I definitely like some of the Mo Monet and the Impasto ones. Uh, but what I really like is the oil glaze one. And the reason why I like this is because it still keeps some of the detail from the background, but it gives it a nice painted kind of look to it. So I'm going to press OK on that. So like I said before, we've got that mask from below. How do we steal it? Well, if you press Alt or Option and click on that mask and move it up, it is going to borrow that mask. Well, what do we want here? Do we want that to be on our, our foreground element? No, we want it to be on our background. So we have to press Command or Control I to invert it. So now we've got that mask happening on the background. So now the, all that effect is only going to happen on our background element. And you see, all I did was borrow that mask and invert it. And I'm going to do that for the rest of this too. Because now what I'm going to do, press Control, Shift, Alt, or E, Command, Shift, Option, or E on a Mac, 
and I'm going to use Topaz Glow. What I like about Topaz Glow is that Glow can give you uh, some really interesting effects in your background and kind of divert the attention of the eye from one area to the next. So in this, uh, I'm going to go to the Fantasy Collection. I like a lot of the stuff that's in the Fantasy and the Afterglow co Collection, but in the Fantasy Collection, I'm going to click on Dream 1. And again, like I said, we're going to get that kind of electrifying glow happening here, but let's change that to soft light. So now what it's doing is it's just taking our background and it's giving us a nice boost or amplification of color. So we'll go ahead and press OK on that one. And again, I only want this to affect my background, not my foreground. So if I press Alt or Option on that mask below and bring it up, it's going to steal the mask from below and make, it, make sure that the glow layer does not affect my uh, foreground element here. And if, uh, if this is affecting the color too much, you can change this to luminosity so it only affects tone and doesn't affect color. Okay, so those blending options are really important. So what the, what the great thing about this is that I just used Topaz Glow. In Glow, I used a blending option of Soft Light. Okay, and then, so normally this is what it would look like with that blending option of Soft Light. And then I came in here and I used the Luminosity blending option in Photoshop. So what it does is it gives you the ability to use two blending options on one layer. That's pretty cool. Now what I could have done is just in Topaz Glow, just ran that layer and then come in Photoshop and change it to soft light, but I wouldn't be able to get the soft light and luminosity. See how that works? So you do the soft light in Glow, and then once you get in here, if it's affecting too much of the color, you just change it to luminosity and it only affect tone. So now let's go into black and white effects. We're going to press Control, Shift, Alt, and E to duplicate that background layer. Now let's go into Filter and go to has black and white effects. One of the things I love about black and white effects is that black and white effects is kind of like Topaz Adjust for black and white images. It can give you some really uh, awesome looking photographs just based on the same kind of adaptive exposure that you used in Topaz Adjust. But right here, I'm just going to reset all of this stuff right here in black and white effects. So it's kind of like a just meets black and white. I think that's the best way I can explain it because you pretty much have all the same stuff here in your adaptive exposure. Some of the things that change are in your color sensitivity and we'll go over that in a second. So looking at this, we're going to go ahead and just look at our basic exposure. We're going to change our contrast a little bit, bring up our contrast just a slight bit, and the brightness, we don't need to mess with brightness too much. I'll bring the brightness down a little bit because the contrast actually makes our image a little bit brighter when it, as it introduces some uh, differences between our lights and darks. And the boost blacks, again, if I bring this all the way up just to get a kind of judgment on what it's going to do and bring it all the way down. All right, let's just go ahead and bring that down just a slight bit. There we go. And then boost whites to really bring out those whites and see what I get and then bring it down. The thing about a black and white photograph is that a good black and white photograph, I said it before, is going to contain black and it's going to contain white. If you make a black and white conversion and it's not black or white anywhere in the photo, it should just be a gray image. <laughs> so it's really important to make sure that the stars of the show, which are black and white, are present during your black and white adjustment. So even in the image that I had before, we didn't really have much black and white. You see that? Everything where, where it is white now, it was black. Now, is some of the white areas in this blowing out? Sure. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because it doesn't really look that bad. So now let's look at some of our adaptive exposure here. Now, this is just like in, uh, in adjust, like I was saying before, that you can adjust those regions and you can adjust that exposure. So let's actually, it's a little too much. Let's go to, let's drop that down a little bit. And let's look at the amount of regions that we have here and bring that down a slight bit too because we already went pretty far with our exposure up here that we don't need to go that far with it down here in the adaptive exposure section. And you can also protect the highlights and the shadows in this if you wanted to, but I don't think I need to protect those too much. And then if we want, we can also bring up the detail a little bit, but that's also might bring out some noise. So let's actually bring that down. Sometimes with the adaptive exposure, just in its nature alone, you're going to bring out some noise. And then if you add the detail to it, you're even bringing out some more noise. Now, this is the part that I really want to discuss is the color sensitivity. And the thing about color sensitivity is that with a black and white photo, you can still manipulate color, even in black and white. So black and color 
in, in reference to black and white. Color has its own tonal value in it. So it, it, you can do this in Photoshop. You can create two different layers. You can create a hue saturation adjustment layer, and then on top of that, make a gradient map for black and white. And then you can go into the hue saturation adjustment layer and you can manipulate the color sliders and guess what? You're going to get a different image because if we look here, as we manipulate red, you're seeing that some of this stuff is changing here. And this is making our red areas lighter and this is making our red areas darker. You might not be able to see it very well in the reds, but let's look at the yellows. Look at the background as it gets brighter and as it gets darker. So you can actually push and pull certain elements, tonal elements of color in your black and white conversion in black and white effects. It's like a one-stop shop. So let's go ahead and bring the greens up too. We can make those a little bit lighter. We can make those a little bit darker. So it's all up to you and what you want to do with this black and white conversion. Now, I'm also going to say something about a good black and white photo. A good black and white photo will usually yield a good color photo. All right, so keep that in mind when we jump into Photoshop because I want to show you something. All right, so if we adjust the cyans here, that it, the cyan really exists on the windshield here of the helicopter. So if I bring the cyans up a little bit, we actually get more of a glare on the windshield, and I think I like that better. And then now let's look at blue. We'll bring the blue up, bring the blue down. Kind of like the blue a little bit darker. So you can see, if we take the color sensitivity off, this was the image before we started manipulating color on our black and white photograph. That's a pretty cool effect. So let's go ahead and open that up, and we'll see what we got here. So now we have a black and white photograph. Now, this is the same trick that we did before. If we change this to luminosity, our black and white photo is now used to make a better color photo because what it's doing is it's selecting those tones and it's just dropping like a, a, a tonal kind of blanket over the image. So it's now long, no longer affecting our color. It's now applying those tonal values to our color photograph. And if we look at this, I like what it's doing to the helicopter, but I don't necessarily like what it's doing to our background. And the reason why is because I want to separate these elements now. If you look at this photograph without that effect on there, if we look at these elements in this photograph, our, our helicopter and our background almost look like they're on the same playing field. So if I turn this back on and I borrow the mask from the one that's just helping the, the helicopter there, press Alt or Option to bring it up, we can now separate that. So now our helicopter is really coming forward. We're separating our elements. We're pushing our, our background back and pulling our foreground forward. We're going to do this in another way here, too. This is going to be really fun. We're going to press Control, Shift, Alt, and E to duplicate all of that area below. So we're doing quite a bit of stuff here. And I just want to show you that sometimes uh, all of these uh, strategies can be used all at once to kind of bombard a photograph. So now what I'm going to be using is something that's specific to Photoshop CC. There's probably other ways that you can do this in other versions of Photoshop, but I'm going to go to Filter, I'm going to go to Blur Gallery, and I'm going to go to what's called Path Blur. And the cool thing about the Path Blur is that you can create some really interesting blurs based on how you manipulate this path. So if I bring this up, bring this up so it's kind of right here on the helicopter blade, and then just bring this one all the way back so it's back here, on that helicopter blade. Let's get the spin of that back helicopter blade and then I can bring this one all the way up here and then maybe even kind of pull this down a little bit so that these blade, the path, is now following the, the rotation of this back blade in particular. So now my blur, my whole image is going to be blurred based on everything kind of swoops in and follows along this path. It's a really cool way to add some really interesting blur to your photograph. And you can increase the speed and make it crazy blurry. Let's, let's just make it a not so crazy blurry, just a half batty blurry. And then we can increase the taper and it kind of uh, adjusts the angle of that blur. So we'll, we'll bring the taper up a little bit and the speed up a little bit. And that looks about good. So we'll just press OK. So now what this has done is it's blurred our entire photograph. But we don't want our entire photograph blurred. So what am I going to do? I'm going to borrow the mask from below by pressing Alt or Option. You see, I made one good mask for this entire photograph. One good mask, and that was it. So we want this to affect our background, not our foreground. So sometimes we make those little oopsies where we grab the wrong mask. Well, I'll just press Control-I and look at that. So now we've got this helicopter really coming off the page because not only is our background lighter, but now it's also blurred. It might be a little too blurry. So what we can do is just drop the opacity on there just a little bit. And that will, uh, that will bring away some of that blur. We can even bring it down just a little bit more. 
And if we wanted to, we could even paint in some more. So let's say I don't necessarily want this area down here to be so blurry. Now, because I'm using a Wacom tablet, I can just paint really lightly, and that's just going to give me kind of a gray tone here. So if I paint really lightly with that, with that tablet, you can see that it's just giving me kind of a grayish tone around this area. If I were to press down really hard, it would make this black but I just want this to be slightly grayed out. So you see how you have a, like full manipulation over this. And to see your mask like this, you can press Alt or Option on the mask. And when you press Alt or Option on that mask, it's going to show you exactly what your mask is affecting. So that looks actually pretty cool. So let's do one last thing, which uh, anytime you do any type of artistic processing, it's usually a good idea. Actually, every single time I process a photo now, I do something called color grading. So I'm going to press Control, Shift, Alt, and E, and that's going to make a stamp of the entire thing that I've done here, all the work I've done here. So if I go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and Restyle. Restyle is like the king of color grading. And it's when you first get Restyle and you jump into here, it's you'll pick something like this and you're like, oh, that doesn't look very good, or oh, that's just way too orange, or um, something like this. It's just really, really green. Now, I like the green that's happening here, but it's a little too much and it's a little too powerful. So let's go ahead and look at some ways that you can use Restyle in a more realistic way that kind of pulls all of your elements together. So if we change this to the change, drop the opacity up here, that's going to drop the overall opacity of that layer. Already it looks better because it's giving me a nice green cast over the entire image. And then I'll change this to something like soft light. So now I, in restyle here, just sim very similar to what we had in black and white effects, I get the ability to manipulate the colors that are happening in this photograph. When this is at full power, you can kind of see where each one of these colors is playing in here. The fifth right here is kind of playing along uh, our helicopter, and then we have this secondary color right here that's really dark in the back, and then this fourth color is probably right here. So as we adjust these colors, and the hue and the saturation and luminance independently, we can kind of manipulate how this color grading is happening. Now, there's many ways that you can color grade in Photoshop. There's a ton of ways that you can color grade in Photoshop, but the most intuitive way to color grade is right here because, yeah, in Photoshop, you might be able to add a gradient map and color grade the photo, but the problem is, is that you don't get instantaneous access to the hue, saturation, and luminance of the colors that you select. It's kind of a, a shoddy method. But right here in Restyle, this gives us the ability to look at the hue, saturation, and luminance of every one of the colors that's happening in our photo so that we can color grade this exactly to the specs that we want. Now, I'm at 100% opacity. As I drop this opacity down, back down to that 30% or so, you can see that this actually creates a nice color cast over the entire image. Now, this was a, a green color that I selected, a greenish type of color setting that I selected here. But let's, let's pick something like... Um, this ice cool and fresh. So it's kind of a grayish tone. Same thing. We'll drop the opacity a little bit and then maybe even change this to something like soft light. And same thing. We get the ability to adjust the luminance, the lightness and darkness, and the saturation in all of the colors on this photo. So it's a nice way to intuitively color grade your photo. You can even mask it. And then you have color temperature settings down here too. So you can really kind of ramp up those, those colors based on exactly what it is that you want out of this photograph. And it probably does help us if we bring the saturation up in this photo a little bit. So really the last thing that I do in any of my processes, no matter if I'm using my own personal workflow or if I'm using a Topaz workflow, the last thing I do is color grading to really pull all the colors in the photo together, especially if you're doing any type of composite work. If you don't color grade the photo to pull all those elements together, it, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a mess. So the color grading kind of refines everything. So really what this, what this is is this, you know, Workflow can be uh, tough, all right? And, and you just have to go into it with the strategy. I've developed many strategies over the years on my workflow. A lot of my workflow consists of what's called the digital and color zone system. Those two systems I use all the time in my workflow, and they make really awesome photographs. But that's kind of my own personal thing. It's my own personal workflow. You can develop your own personal workflow that works with something like Topaz or whatever it is that you decide to bring in there. I highly suggest that you create some type of strategy, some type of workflow strategy that you can bring in. I have a four-step creative process. It's the camera, the tone mapping is step one. Step two is the pre-processing, which is the boring stuff like straightening and maybe some noise reduction, uh, cropping, fixing up little, you know, discolorations dis in your photo or, uh, or 
dust or debris that might be on your sensor, that kind of stuff. That's the pre-processing. The post-processing is where you get in and you I, really, when it comes to post-processing, tone and color is all you need to do. And then you can go into your creative post-processing. That's where you get into these kind of creative effects. Now let's look at the before and after of this photograph to see where we've come. This is a single raw file where you could barely kind of tell the helicopter from the background because the, helico the background was distracting from the helicopter. And then as we progressed through this, we started creating a nice artistic workflow. Now, would I call this, um, you know, something that I would give to a client? Maybe not because this is more of like an artistic type of photo. But this is the artistic process. You know, this is where you have fun with it. You know, nobody else has to see the stuff unless you really want them to. But you just get to have fun. You could print this out on something like metal or canvas, and it would actually be a pretty decent photo. So the whole idea, just develop a strategy. Always have a battle plan when you attack a photo. Because if you go into it uh, without any passion, if you go into it without any idea of what you're going to do, uh, your idea is definitely not going to come across on the final photo. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Blake. This has been an amazing session. You really showed off a lot of creative potential with our products. So really appreciate you joining us and kind of showing us the different strategies you might have for a photograph. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like how you did that. All right. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day, evening, or morning, wherever you are.